Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, thanks for that, Tim. Thanks for organising this. Uh, this was a spur of the moment thing, and um, so what we're going to do is talk about uh, what happens at Springfield and the weather and some of the do's and don'ts, just to give people a few tips for when they arrive, because we've got three things happening this year, hopefully. Um, we've got a cross-country course that leads into a, uh, which is open to um, anybody who wants to attend. Um, limited numbers, of course, but then we've got a, uh, a Springfield Comp, which is a, a fun competition. And then um, in the new year, we have the Comp Class Championships. So, um, I oh, just like a roll call from our people that are going to be talking. Um, so I've got Warwick Bethwaite, Derek Crack, Nick Oakley, Alex McCaw, Sandy Young, and John McCaw. Can you guys just, uh, I can see Alex, I've got you there, uh, but I can't see any of the others. I think Dad's having technical difficulties. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Rightio. Oh, so we've got, oh, well, we've got Alex anyway. <laughs> yeah. So you can you can pick off. Um, so why we've why I've asked a bunch of different people to talk to well, Alex as the CFI uh, has asked uh, these people to to talk about it is because they've all got different um, soaring experience and different aspirations. Some are competition pilots and speed pilots, and some are uh, fun pilots, and uh, and some of the are newly um, uh, new soaring pilots that have a different view on how things work and that's probably a pretty good perspective from people arriving at Springfield uh, because there is some things you need to know and um, and it's a really good fun place to fly and they'll explain some of the do's and don'ts and tips along the way will be all about um, picking up um, how to fly wave most of you in New Zealand know how to fly convergence but they'll talk about that also so We'll kick off with Alex and he'll give you his tips. Well, just to give you a bit of background before you start, Alex is a, um, is our chief flying instructor. Uh, he's the youngest chief flying instructor we've had for many decades, doing a fantastic job. And he's about to end his tenure. Um, Alex is a thousand kilometer diploma pilot, three diamonds and, um, and a good keen soaring pilot and has been a New Zealand representative um, as a junior at the World Junior Championships in Lithuania, along with uh, Nick Oakley, who's just down below, who I can see there, with the Springfield um, terrain in the background. Anyhow, sorry, the uh, floor is yours, Alex. Uh, thank you, Terry, and thank you for organising us. I don't know if you realise this, but we've got 98 people here now, so that's pretty um, good turnout, I would say. Um, so first up, thanks for, thanks for coming, and Springfield is a particularly great place to fly. We've, I think we've probably been there 15 years now. Um, I remember doing some flights there when I was sort of just getting into my flying. So I reckon about 15 years now. In that time, we've sort of learned a lot about the soaring there and sort of where we, where we like to go. And I think it's a pretty cool place. Um, and so I hope um, you guys who are in New Zealand and if there's any people from overseas will get the chance to come and fly with us at some point. Um, I, th I know um, Tim came and enjoyed it um, last year. So um, I'm just going to share my screen. I've got, sort of hastily put a little um, PowerPoint together. Um, hopefully that comes up. So this is our airfield at Springfield. Um, it's well kept. We've got a great team of people who look after the airfield who um, sort of do the day-to-day -day maintenance. Um, we've got a really good um, team who look after the lawns and mow it. So normally um, when you turn up there each week, it's got a different sort of set of um, sort of tram lines that have been mowed into it, which is pretty cool. Um, so it almost looks like a golf course. Um, so um, hopefully I can draw on this. So lucky. This is our um, clubhouse here. Oh, sorry, wrong. This is our clubhouse here. So in here, we've got bunk rooms, um, double bedrooms, kitchen, fireplace. Um, so if you ever want to come stay at Springfield, you're welcome to stay in there. Um, we've got this little building here, which is our sort of 
wool shed um, and workshop. So we can work on gliders and the winch and stuff's kept in there. And then this obviously is our hangar. Um, we keep all our club gliders in there and then there's um, probably 10 or so private owners as well. Um, and then what you can't see is we've got a little control room there um, called Crack Control, named after the famous Derek Crack. And that's where we run all our day-to-day -day operations from. So you can sort of see from there that it's a pretty flat um, place. Um, the mountains are sort of out of view in this, but we're not far away from the mountains. But generally around the airfield, we've got plenty of places we can land if we need to. And it's a nice, safe air airfield to fly from. So it's a great place if you haven't flown in the mountains before, you can progress from flying in the flatlands here to um, moving into the mountains. Um, so moving on, how Terry wanted us to work this, um, we're each going to talk about a sort of aspect of flying from Springfield. And I've sort of chosen to talk about convergence flying because I love flying convergences. I think it's one of sort of my favorite things to do from Springfield and we get some great convergence meetup. So I've drawn a few, I've got a few photos to show. So this is an example of some of the um, convergences we get. Um, so this is sort of down south, um, looking north on the Canterbury Plains. So Springfield's up here somewhere. Um, but quite often we get these convergences that run all the way along the Canterbury Plains. So what happens is we've got the westerly air coming this way, and then we get the cool, if I'm real clever, I'll change this to blue, we get the cool sea air comes in this way, and you can, as you can imagine, you get the air going up there. And sometimes these convergences can run almost the whole length of the South Island. So um, if you get a good day when they set up, you can have real good fun um, flying on them, which I really enjoy. Um, so a little bit about convergences. Um, I don't know if anyone's tried Googling convergences, but it's really hard to find a good diagram um, that explains it. So this is sort of almost describing that previous photo. Um, we've got the warm air coming in this way and the cool sea air coming in this way. And obviously you get a convergence. The trouble or the um, difficulty we can have in the South Island is we get a mountain range sitting here. It's not just flat. So quite often, we the mountain range is gonna stop the air coming in this way. Um, so it can't go anywhere. And that sort of forces the convergence to be set up um, where it is in relation to the mountains. So we still get this um, cold, cool air getting sucked up and we get these daggy clouds normally. And um, Sometimes we can get this cloud, sometimes we, um, we don't. If we're lucky, we get a nice cloud like this. Um, sometimes we'll get um, only these daggy bits here, um, or um, we'll get no clouds at all. So I've got some photos showing um, how it sets up, and hopefully it makes a bit of sense. So these, this is the tallest mountain range, and this is I'm going to guess maybe seven kilometers away from Springfield to the west. It's our first big mountain range. And this is where we get um, normally um, a great convergence set up. So in that last diagram I've shown you, um, we've, it's sort of similar to this. We've got the warm westerly coming in this way. So this photo is looking north. And then we've got, so I'll just change my pen color. We got the cool sea air coming from the east coast here. And you can see this cool air, it's um, not making its way over the mountains. It's just getting forced in here and we've got the warm air coming up over top of it. So you can fly anywhere along this ridge here in the um, nice smooth lift, um, which is pretty spectacular. And you get this really cool um, wall of cloud. Um, what challenges we can have with these convergences is they don't, don't always stay where they are. Sometimes the whole convergence, if the wind from the east coast is particularly strong, it can come in. Oops, sorry. We can get the convergence forces its way in, and it actually can come over the mountain range. And then so you're flying along in the nice smooth list, and then suddenly you're getting the air that's come leaking over the top and coming down, and you can end up in pretty strong um, sink. So the way you avoid that, if you find yourself in that situation, you want to get away from the mountain out here. And you can see in the distance, the convergence is actually forming out in front of the mountain. 
and this is what you sort of have to do if you end up in that situation. So that's one of the traps that can um, happen in Springfield. Particularly, I'll show you on a map um, shortly north of the airfield on the Pukadarakiri range. Um, you can quite often get the easterly coming in and pouring over like that, and um, you can end up in really strong sink. And it can be pretty scary because there's not too many places to land up there. Um, so if you know how to avoid it, it's not too bad, but it does um, can catch a few people out. So here's an example of flying along the ridge with the convergence set up. And you can imagine it's pretty fun. Um, you sort of get little bumps of lift. Um, it's never really consistent, but it's um, a lot smoother than sort of um, flying in the rotor or anything like that. And it's um, pretty fun. So um, there's a couple of types, different types of convergence we get set up. Um, people probably have different names for them, but um, I'll talk about the first one, which is just the sea breeze sort of one. So this is where we get the cold air coming in, and this is what I've been talking about. So you can imagine the cold air coming in this way. And these are this is the tallest range I was talking about, and um, this is the Pukadarakiti range here. So you get the cool air coming in here, and it's pretty hard for it to make its way um, over these mountains, but it's a lot colder. And normally, we've got a light westerly over the country, so you've got the westerly wind coming down here. So this is where we get the convergence set up um, along the tallest range here and the Pukadarakides and also the Ben Moors down here. So I should have mentioned that in the middle of that Springfield um, there. So you can see we're not particularly far from the mountains. Um, I think when Nick jumps in to talk, he's going to talk about how we get away from Springfield. Um, so quite often in these conditions, you want to take a longer tow because you want to get out of this cool um, cool sea air and into the nice warm um, mountain here, which is over here. So I won't um, talk too much about that. I'll let Nick talk about that. Um, the other type of convergence I want to talk about is um, the local convergences we get when it's um, the wind's sort of more or less from one direction. So when we get a westerly wind, which we do get a lot. Um, sorry, stand by. Um, when we get a westerly wind, we and the winds generally from this direction, we get lots of little valley winds around the airfield. Um, so again, Springfield's just down in the middle there. Um, this river you see here um, runs all the way through here. It's called the Waimakariri River. Um, and it goes all, almost all the way to the west coast. So it's a long, long pool of air. So when we get the westerly wind, it comes down through the river here, through the gorge. It's a really little narrow gorge and it comes in sort of this direction, down here like this. Um, down this side here, we've got the Rakai River, which is also another huge river that goes all the way to the um, west coast, basically. And we get, again, we get um, warm westerly air coming down here. So what it happens is it comes through Porter's Pass here, which is another low point, and comes in this way here. And we get a little convergence that's formed here. And so when the wind is westerly, um, sort of probably westerly on the airfield, you'll quite often find a convergence here. And it's a great place to um, get away from the airfield. Um, when it's westerly like this, you can normally get away fairly low. Um, you can climb up in this convergence here. It'll normally be a little bit bubbly and sometimes hard to, hard to find the lift, but it's particularly um, useful and reliable. And it gives you a good jump to then move into the, the mountain. Where's your weather station? Which hill is it on? Uh, our weather station is just there, Tony. I don't know if you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's all. So um, once you get in up high in the convergence there, because it's westerly, we'll normally get the wave lift as well. And I'll let someone else talk about the wave, but we quite often get wave. Um, I'll change color. I'll use green for wave. We quite often get a wave. We quite often get wave behind the bemoors here, so the air comes over like that over this mountain here, down here, and bounces back up about here on the Springfield Ridge. So this ridge here is called the um, Springfield Ridge. So quite often you can climb up in the convergence over Springfield Township, which isn't particularly far away from Springfield, from our airfield, and then you can make your way along the ridge, normally in a bit of ridge lift. And then um, this is a great spot here to climb away into the wave, which will um, help you get away and then you can get into the mountains properly. Um, 
So that's my brief talk about convergences and how to get away from the airfield. Um, my next point is about sort of flying from Springfield in general and how important it is to make sure we know where our land outs are and where there's quite a lot of land outs around Springfield. However, not all of them are good. And I'll leave you with this um, couple of photos here. So this one is Rob um, from our club. He landed out in a field near Castle Hill. Um, quite a nice field. Um, Springfield's just over the, the hills there, so not very far away. Um, nice, easy retrieve right beside the main road. Very easy. This next photo is unfortunately Rob Campbell, um, another member of our club. And he, again, is not very far away from Springfield. Springfield's just over the hill there. However, he's landed on a field that um, not able to get an aerotow from, so hence the helicopter. Um, so it's worthwhile not noting what are the good fields. Um, we can land and get an aerotow retrieve or get a road retrieve, um, and not just using your database of um, land outs um, because they can catch you up. Um, so, and my final slide I'll talk through is just in particular flying from Springfield, we do fly in the mountains, it can be dangerous. Um, and just the importance of making sure you know what you're doing, doing when you're flying in the mountains. Um, particularly when you transition from sort of the smaller ridges into the, um, the bigger mountains. Um, one thing I would say is don't be afraid to do figure of eight near the hill. There's no need to do thermal or um, turns near the hill. You can, you'll most of the time you climb up just as fast doing figure of eights and it's a lot safer. And um, obviously um, work your way through the, um, the Alpine section of the training program, um, particularly focusing on the speed to fly. Um, make sure you've got the safe speed um, when you're in the mountains. So anyway, um, that's my, um, my section done. So I don't know, do you want to jump and go from there, Nick? Yep. All yours, yep. Nick? Right, I'll, I'll better introduce Nick Oakley for you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you too. Cool. Rightio. Um, Nick Oakley, I'm not sure if he actually enjoys wave flying because uh, he got his 1,000k out of the way in 6 hours and 18 minutes or something. So uh, kind of told us that he didn't want to be up there long. Um, Nick's also been a junior representative in Lithuania with, uh, as a teammate with Alex. Uh, he started his instructor's rating with us, uh, but he's also um, cleaned up at several major competitions down at the Merrimah and um, in Springfield. So he's a force to be reckoned with, and he's uh, he's got a pretty sharp standard class glider to uh, to do the job with now. Um, so Nick doesn't do a hell of a lot of flying with us, but when he does, he uh, he gets around the place. Um, he's uh, he's got uh, soaring in his blood. His father, Mike, is the president of our club, and um, and Mike's been flying for many years. So uh, it's all yours, Nick. Take it away. Hey, thanks, Terry. Um, so basically, I'm just going to sort of fill in a couple of points on what Alex said. And my key thing I'm going to start with was um, the getting away from Springfield part. It's a thing uh, we're all still making the mistake today, even the ones who have been flying there a while. And that's uh, with Alex talking about the cold easterly air coming in. So quite often we get the two EMSs with the convergence situation going on. And earlier in the day, before you can even see the convergence has been set up, it might be blue, it's, you wanted to get away a bit, bit earlier. Convergence isn't obvious where it's going to be. And you uh, take a toe on to, I don't know whether Alex you could bring out that map maybe that you had of the area, maybe roughly point maybe where I'm talking about. But uh, the Springfield Ridge uh, is quite often a bolt hole where we tow to, but you get these certain days where, uh, I'll just wait to see if Alice can bring up a, yeah, so we've got the, uh, just Springfield Ridge with Alex, pointing along there. So we quite often tow onto that ridge there, but when you get the easterly uh, pushing in from the uh, east, obviously, it uh, creates this lower air mass. You can quite happily get off on the Springfield Ridge and spend a lot of time going up and down between 
three, four and a half thousand feet, but you can't really go any further than that because you're in this cooler air mass. Yeah, so to get further west, you've either got to, the best option is to basically take the extra $20 tow and tow onto the north end of what we call the Benmore Ridge, mm-hmm. slightly to the northwest of uh, where Alex has highlighted there and get into the better air mass on the western side of the Benmore Range. Um, unless you know some real local little tricks, that's the safest and easiest way to to go about it is to take that longer tow because you can quite often spend a lot of time at Springfield either taking two launches, two or three launches, or mucking around for several hours on the Springfield Ridge trying to get away. And that's a big one that still catches some of us out today. And then uh, if you do get slightly, so circle the Benmore range there for me, Alex. Ken, or just put your mouse on it or something. Yeah, that yes, one. That's the Benmore range there. So if you <laughs> get around onto the western face of that in a thermal day, quite often it's as far as you need to go to uh, get it to. Mm. Uh, the first thing I look at when I go around the corner on the Ben Moors is the little lake that's just to the north of where it's circled there, and that's Lake Linden. And it quite often will give you an idea whether the convergence is pushed in a little bit further west. You can quite often see the wind blowing from both ends of the lake, from the north and south, as the wind's coming out of the Waimakariri River and as it's coming out of the, the Kai River. And you can quite often see them joining on the lake there. And that gives you an indication that the convergence is sitting there. And then the other look is further west as well to Lake Coleridge. And if you can see the wind coming down the lake, that just gives you more um, helps make you make your decision on the understanding of what the day is doing a bit more. And you can understand if the convergence is there or whether it's thermals or whether there's enough wind blowing that it's just going to be pure ridge lift. Um, so that's probably the, I think, a pretty key point at Springfield, especially in thermal conditions, to uh, getting away and then having that safe land, that option, because quite often at Springfield, you need to know all the safe places to land um, to get the best out of flying at Springfield, because if you're always relying on going back to the airfield, you won't, uh, you won't get away some days. You've got to commit to um, potentially landing out, or not landing out, but not having a safe option to go to to get the best out of flying at Springfield. Because at times it can be tricky, but it's also very satisfying at the same time. Um, is there anything else I to talk about? Um, and then when it comes to um, also getting away from Springfield and, and WAVE, uh, we've got airspace over here at the airfield. So basically in a line uh, running sort of northeast to southwest, straight over Springfield. There's an airspace line at five and a half thousand to seven and a half thousand to the west. And we also ha- um, have a gliding area which we open that goes, covers sort of a reasonable area around Springfield, which goes up to nine and a half thousand feet. So we'll put, we can open that pretty much at our leisure, and uh, we do quite often. But when you get into the wave at Springfield, it doesn't take long to get to that 9,500 feet. So we, uh, the thing we always, well, we've learned at Springfield is you want to turn your transponder on quite early. And then we, um, because before you know it, you're at the bottom of the 9,500 feet, having to get clearance from Christchurch to um, get away, to kill, to carry on climbing. And then the other thing I find, I've found over the years at Springfield is when you get in the wave, get well established in the wave. Um, you can quite often in Springfield, you've got uh, a bit of a gap across valleys. And if you don't join up the dots between the mountains further to the north or going to the south to the Lear Mount Hut, you can quite often find yourself in a lot of sink and back down low again. So you want to get well established in the wave and uh, be looking down on roll cards to give you an idea of what's sort of going on before you start tracking north or south. I've found it's made things a lot easier over the years with uh, joining the dots between north and south from leaving the local local area. Um, yeah, it's pretty much. Um, can I can I uh, come in here, Nick? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so um, feel free to ask questions for those who uh, uh, want better understanding or are intending to come and fly at Springfield. Um, 
I know it's just hard while with with just on a Zoom and a and a map, but um, feel free to ask some questions. We've got some more people um, that are going to speak, and um, and we've got some that can't come on. Actually, this uh, this Zoom meeting is oversubscribed apparently, and uh, not even John. And, He's got to speak. Yeah, and uh, so even two of our speakers can't get on because it's oversubscribed. God, we must be bored. Um, but anyhow, fire the questions. Well, Terry. Um, can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Ian Anderson. I'm from up in Auckland. Um, Ian. Yeah. Good what's day. the good day? <laughs> what's the best time of year to uh, be uh, soaring uh, around the Springfield? It started last Tuesday when um, Cindy put us into lockdown, and it'll run the <laughs> end of March. <laughs> okay. All right. From until the end of March, then. Oh, thank you very much. So, so there's there's, a, there's an opportunity for me to go flying when we come out of this uh, lockdown. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the odd thing with Springfield is that most days in the winter, um, you can do a 300k. It's uh, it's amazing. We've um, we've been discovering which ridges work and what conditions work. And um, yeah, it's not unusual to just pop out and do a 300K, um, you know, in the middle of winter, just on the short days. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we had a flight of 730K um, in the wave, of course, but um, but today was a really great convergence and, and wave day and we've had good thermal days, just started popping ever since we were locked up. I, I, I'm, by the way, I'm training uh, for the camp or for the for the training side. Um, how advanced uh, a flyer do you guys want to um, work with? Okay, well, I will hand you over now to uh, Warwick uh, Bethwaite. Warwick is um, a, an experienced instructor uh, for our club. He's been our chief flying instructor a couple of times and for several years. And um, Warwick will be able to uh, speak to these things. Um, Warwick's been around in the club for many years. He put three years of his life into building Springfield, so he loves the place. Uh, Warwick flies a um, self-launching shark from Springfield. Uh, it's just sold an ASW20. And um, you got your ears on Warwick? Warwick Bethway, talk to me. Talk to us. Warwick said he was on. I text him. Uh, the mute, bu the mute button is on my screen. It's down the bottom left-hand uh, side. Warwick, if you can find that. Yeah, that's good, Terry. Hey, gotcha. Hello, Terry. There he yeah. is. Technology, technology of, of, of Sasta. Um, yes, um, thanks, for the, thanks for the invite, Terry. Um, straight into the answering um, the question from the chap up in Auckland, who I've forgotten his name, sorry. Um, Ian, is it? Yeah. Hi, hi Ian. Yeah, um, yep. Yeah, righto. Um, very, very easy to answer. Um, you need to be able to um, to do nice balanced turns with good attitude and speed control um, constantly and really, 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 really good lookout um, and you'll be into it. Um, Thank you. But, Excellent. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. It, we, <laughs> you, for this particular course, um, you know, we're not teaching flash arrow pilots to be flasher. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to introduce people to mountain flying and particularly in our area. So just really good basic flying skills um, is what's required and a desire to learn heaps. Well, one, one last question, when does the course start? Um, Terry, sorry, help me out there, will you vote please? Um, pass. Ask Alex. Alex. <laughs> yeah, Alex. Uh, Actual date. Good question. Uh, it's, the week, it's the week before our um, Springfield comp. Check the GNZ website. Yeah. We'll give you the answer yeah, to the question shortly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Well, um, just okay. So, um, getting on to what I, want, what I wanted to mention, um, I'm not anywhere near as organised as, as Alex and Matt, but I've made a few notes here. Um, I think one of the key things with Springfield is that you are off the ground and in the mountains in a flash, and that means you are really in the mountains with all of the ups and downs and the different weather conditions that can happen so fast. So don't take the place lightly. And this is, I'm not trying to scare people off, I'm just being realistic. Um, the best way to appreciate Springfield is to come there, even if you're a, even if you're a, a, um, a pretty experienced pilot, 
you need to come to Springfield and fly with another pilot and have a good look around the local area and then have a good few flights, um, soaring flights, within 50 or so k's of Springfield and really, really get to know the local area well before you head off. Because conditions change unbelievably fast. Um, go away, Michael. That was Michael Oakley ringing me. Sorry, guys, I'll just tell him to go away. What's he ringing? He should be on Zoom. The call now. <laughs> um, so things change really fast. So come down, fly with another experienced pilot, local pilot, and um, and then put a put put the you land out options on a little bit of paper on your um on your map or your PDA, whatever you use, and go and have a look at them and get really familiar with the main areas. And the main areas are up in the um, the Wymac Gorge area, um, in around Flock Hill, up in the um, the Coleridge Basin, around Lake Linden, and up into the follow the main road all the way through to Arthur's Pass and north up to the head of the Pukasraki Range, including the Lees Valley area. That sort of general local area. And if um, Alex has got his map out, um, he can put a great big circle around this area. It's basically bounded by the two big rivers, um, the Wainak um, and the Rakaia, going all the way back to the main divide. Oh, wow. What area were you talking about, Warwick? The, um, the great big soaring area that we've got between the two rivers, between the Wimac and the Rakaia, right into the main divide. And it seems like a big area, but when you get down close to it, there are some very obvious areas which are completely unlandable and some very obvious areas that are really good. So if you get those in your head and then you get the main mountain ranges in your head, you're away. Have we got that map up yet, Alex? Uh, you should be able to see it. I can't see it yet. Uh, there it is. Great. Um, uh, how bloody things gone away. Let me know where you want me to highlight. Yeah, okay. I've got it. Cool. Thanks, bud. Um, so yeah, that, that just that, that's the starter, is get to know that local area and um, I'm I'm totally non techy at all, but I've spent hours on um, Google Earth um, on the in the 3D map where you can tilt the map along, going down and having a look at areas. Like I've put myself down in um, in the Rakaia Gorge, up the head of the Rakaia Gorge somewhere, and I've turned it round and I've looked down the gorge and I've looked at all the options as as if, as if I was flying down the gorge and being spat out of there by a screaming westerly because I've been dumped by the wave. What in the hell am I going to do next? Um, and it's really helped me a lot in this area because it's it's a pretty dynamic area to fly. And if you don't know where you are, and if you're like me, when, when the pressure goes on, sometimes you forget that. Um, it's really helped me a lot. So that's what I would do. If I was going to Springfield for the first time, I'd be studying it like crazy on Google Earth in that particular area that, that I've that I've highlighted, because you can have some fantastic flying and not have to go anywhere further north or south than where I've just described. Um, now, getting away from Springfield itself, I completely concur with um, Nick's comments about not just taking a shortish tow onto the Springfield Ridge. I, st I still do that. Um, I'm not a fast learner. I still sit there on the Springfield Ridge for sometimes two hours before I manage to get away from there. Um, so put your hand in your pocket, take a longer tow to the other side or up onto the high part of the Big Ben range um, is, is a good idea to start with. Now, when you, um, on a normal convergence thermal type day or, or with a light westerly, um, the lee of the Big Ben range can you put a dot there, Alex, please, where that um, the red hut is in the lee of the Big Ben Range? Uh, back here. Uh, the lee of the Big Ben Range. Yeah, where those two dots are. Somewhere in there. You can see the two red dots, which Alex has highlighted in there. Um, you'll get some winds coming up the, the um, from the Porter's Pass side and also from the Lake Coleridge side. And you'll also get a bit of wind coming over top of the Big Ben, Big ben Range. And that area in the middle tends to develop some really good convergences. Sometimes you're not quite sure what's what's actually 
the, the key factor involved, but you'll often have to be quite close into the lee of the Big Bend range um, before you'll get some really, really good lift. Um, and the secret in there is to just follow the lift all the way to the top. I wouldn't go anywhere, well, I would in the past, but I wouldn't now, go anywhere until I feel like I've sort of topped out the lift in that area and then potentially head straight over the Big Bend range um, in towards the southern part of the Craggy Burns, which is another spot we need to have a look at, Alex, called Red Hill. And we'll move, we'll move the map across just a little bit um, so we can go across to Red Hill. It's Red Hills. Yeah, there you go, Alex, across to where are we? No, a bit further across here. Yeah, there you go. Go on, yeah. Um, Red Hill is very obvious when you're flying towards it. You've got um, Lake Linden on your right hand side, and it faces, it's got a lovely scree slope that faces directly towards Lake Coleridge, and the lower level winds from the west, even if they're coming from the northwest, the west, or the slight southwest, they'll tend to come up that slope um, and work quite well. So that's another, it's sort of a bolt hole spot to get to and then sit there for a while um, while you sort out exactly where you're going to go next. So climb as high as you can there and then slowly start to push into wind. Um, and I mean slowly, um, it's very tentative steps around here. Um, a lot of the guys that have done this a lot will just barrel straight onto the Craigie Burns. And what height do you typically get there? Oh, that area there, I, I'd, I'd want to be five and a half or 6,000 feet okay. um, to comfortably um, head straight onto the Craigie Burns. But if you can't get that high there, if you're still hanging around the fives or four and a half or whatever, you can play there by just moving slowly out into wind towards like Coleridge with those little those little knobs um, that are sitting out there a couple of kilometres out from the out to the west of the of Red Hill, and you'll pick up some quite good lift there, and you'll find yourself going out to the west and arcing around to the north, and find yourself on the front face of um, of uh, Mount, um, come on, somebody help me, please. Not Mount Enos. Um, yeah. Right out. Uh, where's, where's the ski field? Right out further. Oh, Mount Olympus. Sorry. Mount, Olymp Mount Olympus. Yeah. You can you can miss out um, that piece of the Craigie Burns by flying further west and arcing around in front of Mount Olympus. And Mount Olympus will usually give you a really good ride, but um, just don't get there too low. Um, it's got a beautiful scree slope on it, but um, if you're not 100% certain on which way the wind's blowing, you can see the, the way that face is shaped. Um, the wind can sometimes be running along it, um, especially at lower level, which can be a bit uh, of a shock. Warwick, shock sorry, sorry to interrupt, just picked yep. up on something you said, Terry here, just yep. picked up on something important you said, it pays to stay on the tops. We do our flying on the yep. tops. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I've done a fair bit of flying around that area lower than the tops, just learning, but I've always um, had that red hill as a bolt hole to go back to pretty bloody quickly if I don't like what I'm feeling. Um, but yeah, if you get on the tops and stay on the tops, then you've got an absolutely beautiful ride along along the Craggy Burns north and then out into the across the Wymac and potentially downwind a little bit onto the top of the Rackadies. But um, that's probably enough for one. I just want to bring up one or two little points I made here um, that some of you guys that may have been here before will pick up on. Back to Lake Linden, sorry, um, Alex. When you are flying from the Big Bend Range across the top towards Red Hill and you've got Lake Linden on your right, and you're flying west. Um, there's an obvious gravel road that comes out of Lake Linden and heads down towards the Rakaia River Valley. And about 5k down the road, right there, um, where you had your, yeah, that's the road that runs down there, there is a really obvious straight piece of road for only, it's dead straight for about um, a kilometre or two, but it sticks out like dog's nuts from the air. And it's got a really sharp 90 degree bend at the end of it. It's almost a guaranteed trigger point for convergence and wave. Um, it's, it's, it's like, I don't know, it's always there, pretty much. So that's one little spot to put on your mark on your map. 
but also be very aware that there's not a hell of a lot of good options to land in there. And if you, if you get in there and you and it's not working, you really need a plan before it's not working. Um, and generally, the plan in there is is don't go in there um, too low, and turn and get out of there reasonably quickly, and back onto the big bend range, or around into the Rakaia, if you've got the the desire to do that. But I don't often do that. Um, you just got to come back. Um, now, one little spot which I found, uh, Jerry O'Neill introduced me to this spot. Um, there's some foothill, low foothills in the lee of the Torless Range. If, you, if you're travelling on the main road um, through to Porter's Pass, they're just on your right hand side before you go through Porter's Pass. Um, it's the head of the, yeah, the, the head of the Kawa River. Is up yeah, that's the one there. Yeah, Alex. Yeah. Now, on a summer's day, um, when the Eastley is blowing out on the plains, um, by lunchtime, the Eastley hasn't yet got up the Wymac River, and those little hills there have been sitting in the sunshine all morning with no wind on them. But there could be a breeze by then has struck Springfield Airfield, um, but it's not enough of a breeze for, the, for anything to be like ridge lift around the field or anything. Um, but it's colder air and the thermals are not that great. So if you get around there, those foothills are a really good thermal source, um, quite reliable and reasonably close to the airfield. So you can play around there for a while. Um, if you get high enough, you've got a couple of options. You can head into the Waimak River Valley and and just try and thermal your way um, to um, six and a half, seven, even 8,000 feet to jump across the river onto the Pukasarakiti Range or you can head around the corner um, into Porter's Pass and get onto the western side of the Torless Range. And by that stage, the day is developing more and you may find that you've got some, some thermals in there um, to get up on the tops of the Torless Range. Um, so that was a, that's a, just a little local area and I don't see many, I don't see many people using it. Um, um, have you do you fly on the? Oh, you got you just um, fly way higher than I do generally, Terry. Do you got, do you use those foothills at all? I have to switch my sound back on. No. Oh, well, uh, yeah. um, Sorry, I wasn't watching. Actually, were you talking about the foothills at the bottom of the Pukaturaki Range? No, so the, the ones the ones the ones on the just the lee of the um, Torless Range where the Kaua River, um, the head of the Kaua River is. Oh, I will try anything. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, but as you've said, you try and get as high as you can in the best source of lift, which yeah. is what was explained earlier by Nick and yourself uh, along the Springfield Ridge, yeah. uh, the uh, southwest end of the Springfield Ridge. And um, hopefully somebody's marked where the next best one is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Can I say just one more thing quickly on, <laughs> on wave flying in, out of Springfield? Um, I know... Um, lots of the people listening here will have had rough wave flights, but my experience is that flying in the wave at Springfield, you can go from a relatively benign tow to all hell breaking loose in a millisecond. And uh, am I still on? Oh, it's my screen's gone dead. Yeah, no, you're still going well. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, yeah, in a millisecond. So if you're flying on a day, when there's obvious wave around and from the airfield looking west, it will be excessively obvious. It's extremely obvious. Um, be prepared before you take off um, and be prepared for a brisk downwind when you're coming into land. Um, you can often have 40 knots of very rough air right up your date on downwind. And then you'll have a um, a wind shear from hell when you turn on to final. And on the ground, there'll be no wind at all. It'll be dead calm. Um, it's not unusual. So it's it's um, it's a place to really watch. And the, the wave is fantastic around Springfield. Um, but that a couple of these things make me come back to that point. If you haven't flown here before, come down and fly with a, a really current cross-country pilot out of Springfield and get to know the local area first and to get the best of it. 
Thanks very much, Warwick. That's You're really done. good. Um, were you sorry? Are you done? Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. No. Good. On, thanks, Warwick. That's great. That just brings us to um, a change of gear, actually. So we've we've got um, our um, new chief flying instructor's wife uh, is hopefully going to speak next. Uh, Sandy um, uh, has Sandy Yong. Um, sometimes known as moose because she goes wave flying in a moose suit uh, to keep herself warm. Is um, she's just at the stage where she's gone from um, from sort of early solo stage through to intermediate uh, stage, and um, so and Sandy, um, I just wanted to, well Alex McCaw wanted Sandy's um, view of how to treat Springfield as a intermediate pilot. Uh, and what to look out for. And you'll see Sandy on your screen. She's on the bottom of my screen, second from the bottom right, um, with a couple of phantoms either side of her um, as a background screen. So, Sandy, can we hand over to you? And can you give us your tips and your thoughts, please? Sure. Um, this was the conversation I had with Terry about an hour ago. It went something like, um, Sandy, do you want to talk at this meeting tonight? No. Well, just give your top five tips. I don't have five tips. And it goes like, who else is talking? So Alex and, and Wall and Terry and all these guns. And then there's me. So anyway, uh, flying at Springfield. Well, the great thing about flying at Springfield is that we've got a lot of really good pilots and we've got a lot of good pilots that do big cross countries so that's really inspiring plus it gives you the opportunity to hop in the back seat act as ballast and you get to see um, the bigger country you get to um, see why people or some of these pilots who are really good and really experienced choose the the way they go or the way they interpret the sky so in terms of the learning experience it's it's really awesome at Springfield and the the pilots are great they're very sharing with their knowledge um, so that's that's been something I've really enjoyed um, learning at Springfield that's been awesome um, top five tips <laughs> talk to the tow pilot get a get a feel for what the sky is doing um i'm a really conservative pilot so um i tend to like to see what people are doing i did a lot of sort of sky watching um what the other uh, gliders are doing in the air and decide you know how how do i feel about that situation um Another good thing I find really useful is getting someone to interpret the sky, what they're seeing when they look out the window and giving you an indication of why they would choose a certain route. Because um, that's a bit that I find quite difficult is really reading the sky. Um, so Sandy's just interrupt you there. So for anyone yep. visiting Springfield, you'd suggest that they ask these questions to the tow pilots, to the other pilots, and to the experienced guys? Absolutely. Get get a seat in a two-seater. Um, yeah, and just, just get a feel for how it works, where it works. Um, yeah, and, and just learning the terrain, because it's actually quite confusing in Springfield. The, the ridges aren't all parallel. They go in funny directions, and um, the wind follows the valley so it does quite quirky things um, and certainly sort of coming from a paragliding background um, and changing into gliding you know flying into the lee side of these big hills looking for the getting into the waves that's um, that that I found very very challenging um, but it's flying with people and sort of breaking down some of those barriers as to um, what's doable and what's not um, Probably one of the challenging things at Springfield is the mountains and how far you can go without um, and still be in a safe glide back to, to Springfield. So I haven't done any land out training yet. So um, I've still got my apron strings on um, 
And that's probably the thing that I find quite difficult is knowing what my turnaround height is that I can get back to the um, get back to the um, airfield safely. But so for, for, oh, can I just hop in here again, Sandy? Um, sure. For anyone visiting Springfield, or if you're coming to some of the events at Springfield, um, there's a high chance that there will be other. Uh, other aircraft there that you can, we can do um, rides around to, to look at the strips. The boys did this last time with um, when they had their micro lights there and um, Mike Oakley's got a Piper Cub. Um, and we can just give a quick zip around the local area to look at the nearby strips for landing out, um, so, which is kind of what Sandy was talking about, you know, knowing where to go. Sorry, back to you, Sandy. Yeah, and probably just to reiterate um, from Alex, a uh, couple of the key sites are um, the end of that Springfield Ridge, sort of near Springfield Town, that often is a good place to um, snoop for lift, um, opposite over the top of Limeworks is another good safe place. And um, just at the end of the Springfield Ridge, sort of just in front of Mount Russell's another good place and um, you know know what your turnaround height is if you're at kind of my level that you know you can get back so yeah there's a couple of ways that you can get back and and sometimes on a really good um, wave day the airfield is awesome it just goes nuts over the airfield all right you uh... Thanks for that, Sandy. You you uh, no done your tips, have you? <laughs> that that was it. <laughs> Good work. Thank you. I think everybody uh, got something from that. Much appreciated. Um, now we've got um, John McCaw. He finally made it on. Somebody must have hopped off and made room for John McCaw to get on. So um, John's uh, our uh, club captain and uh, and an instructor. Um, John's kind of we. we consider him the ace of the base he for a handicap value he does the the most kilometers and the most flying time in a standard cirrus uh, in the club um and uh, he's normally the first in the year and one of the last back he um he certainly gets his money's worth out of uh, out of that lovely little cirrus he flies um and john's going to give us uh, hopefully his tips there you, are you on john yep can you hear me yeah can too loud and clear cool oh um, good evening, everybody. There's a um, fair old crowd there. Sorry, I had technical problems. I'm not sure why, but um, yeah, look, um, one thing I must say that um, Springfield's an awesome place. It just takes a little while to get used to it. Um, look, I wasn't sure what the other guys said before, but um, I think you just need a little bit of uh, time in the air to, um, to get to know the place and, and baby steps and uh, move your way a little bit further on. Um, and uh, it's a pretty, pretty exciting um, place. Um, we obviously covered the, the, the Springfield Ridge and the, and the way the um, wave will often be at the possible at the south end of the um, ridge. You often climb right into it. We did last weekend, Terry, was it? Last time we were allowed to fly. Um, went straight into the wave and climbed to 9,500 feet. Um, just pushed into wind uh, straight across to, um, I heard Warwick talking about Red Hill, which is, um, I actually didn't need to use that, but I will use that if I can't can't um, get up. And then we sort of ridge sawed the um, craggy beans last weekend, and it was quite neat with all the skiers along there were just people um, walking John, along. If, you're, if you remember, I didn't get away in my Cirrus. You took the lift with you. <laughs> <laughs> Terry just doesn't can't handle the small wings. <laughs> so um, yeah, we had a great day. But look, there's all there's some really important things about Springfield. Um, you know, look, I think the key thing is you. Know, I'll just write, I've written down a few little things that I um, that might help. Um, the key thing in the mountains is always have an escape route. Um, and I think, you know, always look behind or if you're up some valley or whatever, make sure you've always got a way out um, to landable ground or somewhere. Um, so you're always looking looking to make sure you don't get stuck um, 
and um, you know that might be down a valley or whatever um, and um, just make sure you don't uh, um, probably I'm not sure if Nick were you talking about the lakes and the way the winds blow on the lakes as well using that as a bit of an indicator yeah I covered um, that I did um, actually put some I've got some photos here I could perhaps flick through just near the end anyway but the other thing is the venturi effects down the valleys and I think that especially in the require I notice when you fly south and wave and you get into that low down on, over the require you that wind is, is particularly strong so you can get yourself into trouble and it's um, just the best way to have an escape route is to head towards the sea um, and get try and get out. Um, the other thing about crossing ridges and things like that, just make sure you always cross them at an angle. If you go straight for them, you're asking for trouble because your sink rate can just get so high. Um, but if you cross them at, a, at an angle, it's um, a heck of a lot safer. So before you go. Um, probably another thing is always look up when um, a Springfield for your wave. Hello, Abby. <laughs> um, just when you're on the Springfield Ridge, always, if you're looking for a wave, always go up one first and check that out because, um, you know, that's a, it's much easier to do that than, um, than end up and then check down wind. So um, the other thing, perhaps keep your speed up near the ridges. It's absolutely essential because you get some awful bumps. So there's nothing like having a bit of reserve speed to get you out of trouble and um, was perhaps even like that last weekend soaring along the ridges. Um, um, normally the figure eights and the thermals to make sure, absolutely sure, never turn in towards a ridge because the sink rate can get so high, um, you're not going to get round. So if you're ever in doubt, always turn away from the ridge. Um, another thing that can happen at Springfield is the Torless wave. Um, uh, or tallish range may not be working even though it's directly into wind and that's often because the craggy burn wave or a wave can be dumping on the ridge itself so just don't be surprised that can happen it might give you a little bit of lift but it's not like what you'd expect so um, you've got to be prepared to move away um, another thing I did note down there about Springfield to occasionally we have a front coming up the coast and um, cloud comes in into the spring field and you might be in the mountains soaring in different air. So you've got to be prepared um, to perhaps land in the valley like at, um, up at Castle Hill in the, in the valley on a strip if you're not likely to get back because you could be over eight eighths cloud. You might be at seven or eight thousand feet and still um, find you've got eight eights over spring field. So you've just got to be uh, always aware of that rather than trying turning down over the eight eights and um, because it's damn dangerous. So, you know, we've had a few times where we've had to send down through, you know, holes or whatever, but if you're ever in doubt, go and land in a, in a safe spot. Um, uh, Warwick talked about flying in turbulence. Um, I seem to spend a fair while doing it um, and um, always just ensure that you make sure you don't let your, your glider go too fast and, um, and over speed it because um, try and keep below your manoeuvring speed. So even if you get tipped upside down or whatever, just try and keep your, keep your speed back and, um, and also just uh, open your brakes or whatever if you're um, really bad, but you can toss you upside down, but just don't scare them don't away. Your speed. That you doesn't happen your very wings. often. Is that right, Terry? It's, yeah, yeah, don't scare them away. That doesn't happen often. No, 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 look, I know, but I just, yeah, just, just a few things, you We're know, just to... to sell the place here. <laughs> We're supposed to be trying to sell the place. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, look, it's just, just a little, it's just some tips I put with general flying too, but look, I mean, we, we have some absolutely marvellous, you know, um, conditions at Springfield and every day is different and... Um, you know, one day you can be flying and, and a thermals convergence ridge and wave all, all within a few minutes. So, you know, it's um, it's absolutely marvellous. And there are lots of land out places that are safe. And um, there's just a few point, pointers that, um, that you need to be um, prep stopped if, you know, um, areas that can't land in. So just got to be wary of those. And um, I think if, 
if anything, it's probably feels safer to me than flying at Meta Meta with little paddocks. What? So, um, yeah. But look, I was just a few of those tips, just to might keep you safe, you know, about that. I'm not trying to scare you off, but we, look, we we uh, had wave flying along at 19,000 feet the other day, and it was just beautifully smooth. So, and same with the wave last week, it was um, absolutely smooth. And I don't know why Terry couldn't get in it. He doesn't know what he's doing. I was, <laughs> mowing, the, I was mowing the grass, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> doing my bit. Yeah, hey, thanks very much, Johnny. That's uh, yeah. that's really good. Um, just you can just give us a show of hands, actually. Um, if anybody, uh, with Mike Mara, um, who's our contest director and our local engineer, and Mike and his wife Joan um, really look after our airfield and they're planning the Springfield comp um, or fun competition or uh, uh, whatever you want to call it. And um, and Mike's. Just prepared to let him, let everybody know a little bit about what's going on there um, with accommodation, uh, booking system for the uh, the bunkhouse and so on. Just anyone put their hand up if they're inter interested to know that. Oh yeah, a few hands going up. Righty, we well, just uh, Mike, if you can give us a quick um, tune in on that department. If you unmute yourself, please. And okay, uh, good evening all. And uh, after a, a great day flying in the wave. Uh, it'll be a, a much better day when you come back and have a beer and you've got somewhere to stay right on the uh, on the airfield. So we have a, a lovely uh, country house, uh, perfectly situated looking out to the uh, northwest, great view over the airfield and the foothills. And it contains uh, four uh, separate uh, bedrooms uh, with a combination of uh, bunks and double beds and single beds. Um, Bunk room's got six in it. Uh, two, uh, two other bedrooms have got a double bed. One of them's got a bunk. One's just got the, uh, uh, the VIP suite has just got a double bed. Uh, we have uh, three toilets, uh, three showers, and it's situated, uh, obviously all the facilities of a, of a normal country house, kitchen and uh, uh, cooking facilities and uh, laundry. Now, the only thing you have to bring is um, a pillowcase and a towel and a sleeping bag. Uh, pillows are supplied, and for um, for staying on uh, in the house, it's uh, only fifteen dollars per person. And um, the nearest uh, shopping is at Darfield, uh, where there's a supermarket. That's twenty minutes, but we've also got uh, Sheffield, um, 10 minutes up the road, and Springfield, uh, 10 minutes up the road as well. So all of this has been put on to our Canterbury Gliding Club website um, by the famous uh, Edwin, who's hiding in amongst the Muppets uh, there on page one. Um, under the uh, Our Club uh, tab, and if you scroll through that, you'll see uh, the facilities that we've got uh, in and around the uh, airfield. Um, and whilst, whilst you're in there, uh, he's done a marvellous job of putting all the land outs that we regularly use under the resources tab. Um, so clicking on the resources and alongside is uh, an arrow to get to uh, land out, uh, a land out guide. And uh, it is uh, excellent uh, pre-briefing if you're flying in, in, in and around the mountains. Uh, other facilities on the field, uh, great uh, uh, unlimited camping, uh, plenty of tent sites, uh, four powered uh, caravan uh, sites, um, and all of that has access to an outside uh, toilet and shower block. Um, we have a barbecue, um, so that's about what we've uh, got to offer. Um, a nice fridge with uh, cool beer. The house is uh, situated next to the briefing room. So for those who are coming from out of town, um, staying on the airfield uh, is, a, is a big plus. Thanks, Terry.
All right. How is do there we any... book? <laughs> Alex. <laughs> is there any questions? Yeah, how do you book? Um, there's a, a you send uh, Joan uh, an email um, and I'll, I can give that to you. It's J M M A R R A, J M Mara at hotmail.com. There's a link on our website as well, isn't there, Mike, under the contest tab, I assume. Ah, true. For, yeah, for those who are coming to the competition or uh, just need a, a further background, there's, a, there's an operational briefing on the uh, contest tab, and that has a link to um, accommodation costs and the booking system. Perfect. Um, Any other questions? Yes, I got one about the airspace to the over the airfield, the banana-shaped uh, area there. Yeah. How do you cope with that when you're ridge soaring and get up in these convergences? So, uh, mm. oh, I'll so um, I don't know if you can see there, Tony, but we've got two glider flying areas um, which we can open. Um, so I don't have my map in front of me, unfortunately, but one we can open to nine and a half thousand feet. And the other one slightly south of the airfield we can open, which gives us to 12 and a half thousand feet, I think, which um, is plenty of height if you just want to play around in the wave. If you want to, do want to go away and um, go on a pretty long cross country flight, it's quite normal for us just to go on to um, control. And they're pretty good with us. Um, Unless you're Tim, we don't seem to tend to have um, too many problems. Um, and uh, especially at the moment when we don't have many flights coming over from the Tasman, they're more than happy to let us um, up into the airspace. A lot of my it's life. This area in here. Oh, I can't see that, Tony, unfortunately. Uh, the, yes. The uh, there. Uh, that yeah. map doesn't have the glider flying areas on, I don't think, Tony. No. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so so, and yeah. you boil that down, and you got to delight. I'll jump on. I'll jump on to some other questions that have come through the text here. Um, so, Iceman, who um, used to be one of our tow pilots, and would love to have you back anytime you want, Iceman. Um, he's asked, "Where do the wave lines set up for traditional Norwest days? Um, perhaps we can show a sky sight um, or us." So um, I'll share my screen again. Um, so stand by. So we're sort of lucky and unlucky, I guess. Tomorrow is a wave day, so I've pulled up the sky site weather for tomorrow, um, and this here is looking at the wave predicted wave for. Um, I think I've got it set at 13,000 feet. So I don't know, hopefully you can see my mouth there, but Springfield's down in here. Um, so um, the main wave we get to initially climb away from is what the guys were talking about, is behind the Benmores, which is here, and behind the Torless, and you can sort of see it links together. So this is a great place to get um, away in the wave to start with. And then um, if we zoom out to sort of South Island level, um, Tomorrow is not a particularly good day. The wave's a bit messy down south, but going north, you can see that it sort of lines up behind the Pukaturakiti range in Lees Valley here, and then um, going up to Hamner, and then the really good guys go all the way up to um, Blenheim in that same sort of wave setup. So I'll jump into the other map, which is a bit easier for everyone to see, and draw some pictures. Um, so like I was showing, the wave sets up behind the Torless and behind the Benmores like that. That's sort of where we climb away from. And then we want to jump into the wave. There's a couple of ways to do it, but we quite often on a Norwest day, you'll get the wave sitting behind the, um, in Lees Valley here behind the Pukaturakides. And that's um, a great way to jump to go north. And then south, we get the wave set up sort of behind, depends which way the wind's coming from, but behind Mount Hut in here somewhere. So that's sort of, if you're staying around the general area, that's sort of what we play around with. So I don't know, does that answer your questions, Iceman? Perfect. Um, we have another question there. Um, I think it's Roland. Um, do you guys have a land out booklet? And I think um, Mike answered that. So if you jump onto our website, there's a land out guide there. 
Um, Edwin's doing his best to keep it updated and add a few more, but majority of the airfields um, or land out options are on there and they're really good. Edwin's done a great job taking some drone shots of the um, field, so you get a pretty good idea of what to expect. Um, does anyone have any other questions? I think you can use the hands up function or type them in and we'll answer them out. I've got a quick I've got a quick question here. It's uh, David from Auckland. So um, the question I've got, hoping to come down in November, is is Condor 2 for scenery any use for like preparing for understanding the terrain down in that area? Uh, I think I actually personally think it's a really great tool. Yeah, it's a good way for um, having a look at the scenery. Some of the um, but you do have to have a bit of caution with sort of where you can fly and sort of what ridges you can ridge saw in particular. Um, that will not work from Springfield, but a great way to get an idea of where to fly, where the landouts are, um, where you can expect lift. So no, it's a, it's a great tool. And I think um, yeah, well, people should utilize it more, really. It's very realistic when it comes to the scenery, just even flying around, seeing what the mountains look like in the valleys. I'd say it's... Um, Pretty good tool for that. It's just not very realistic where the lift is, though, is it? Yes and no, yeah, yeah. It no, shows that. I've watched yeah. people ridge saw along Mount Hutt on, the, on that condor thing. Mount Hutt doesn't work. It's just, uh, yeah. Anyhow, just take that with a bar, uh, with a bar of salt, with a grain of salt. Um, uh, if you're trying to uh, figure out what's going on uh, with the lift at uh, Springfield. I guess what everybody tonight has been trying to say is that you, um, the, the first experience at Springfield should be kind of a put your toe in the water and, um, and just go quietly. Every day is a new experience there and you don't have to do it all in one day. Um, you, you just uh, take it a little bit at a time and you'll fly safely around there because there are many fish hooks and there's certain places that you want to uh, want to go um, with a bit of altitude. But it's really fun and it's exciting and it's a, a good atmosphere on the ground. Unlike most gliding sites are, um, in the South Island, or some sites in the South Island that we've been to, the easterly comes screaming in at the um, end of the day with the heat low and it's freezing cold. Well, Springfield's pretty much the opposite. Uh, generally, it's pretty warm at the end of a summer's day. Um, it's just nice to uh, get back and sit under the big oak tree or uh, whatever and um, and uh, have a quiet one and a debrief. And as uh, Mike has been saying, we've got good facilities there. There's, um, there, there's uh, flush toilets. First time we've had them in 45 years in the, in the Canterbury Gliding Club. So we're pretty proud of the place and it's well looked after and... Um, and we'd like to see people there coming to join us. Um, that's not what this was all about, of course. This was about just sharing some knowledge with our site uh, that, we're, that we're pretty proud of and pleased to fly at. And, um, and if Tim wants to run another one of these things, we'll do one on a specific subject and maybe get um, the, the likes of um, Justin Wills to come and talk for us on uh, some wave flying and uh, um, stuff like that. And we can, we can talk about wave and get some of the guns to talk about their wave flying experience or something. Uh, back to you, Tim. Have we missed something we should be uh, doing? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Terry. The um, couple of things. One, we've got the events calendar with all of the events mentioned, uh, the training course and the Springfield competition and all the other New Zealand uh, contests and events are on the gliding uh, website. So go check out the events calendar. Uh, entry forms are slowly being opened as contest organizers get organized to open the entry forms. So I think the Springfield ones, Mike's already set them up. So you can actually enter already on the website for the Springfield contest. Um, and yeah, we will definitely be making sure the next conferences will allow more than 100 people. And We'll organize some more as well. We've got another week at least, maybe more of lockdown. So we'll do another one in a, maybe later in the week or next weekend. All right. Thanks very much, Tim. Terry. All right, we'll stop recording. Yep. Terry, I've got about six or seven photos that 
I could prep share on the screen if I can make it work. Yep. Would that be useful? Or? Yeah, go for it. I'll just look, I'll just um, try and see if I can make this work. Um, share my screen. Where do you share your screen? Oh, no. Make sure you yeah. have the right screen. Maybe while you're doing that, someone can go and rescue Edwin from those Muppets <laughs> who are attacking him. Hey, Neil Ellison, Neil no, Ellison, I tried I'd to order the, the weather station and they're, they're away on holiday. <laughs> Alex, I've just pushed sheer screen. That should work, shouldn't it? I should do. You might just have to hit OK or something like that um, down the bottom. Okay, for it. Links seem to be wanting to go. This was a good practice run meeting. Next uh, yeah, tomorrow night, we'll do the real thing, eh? <laughs> Tim only allowed a few people to share their screen, and because John uh, joined later on, it may be a case of he might not be allowed yet. No, he should have access. All right, cool. I'll just try once more. Stand by. It's a two-step process. You have to share your screen, then you have to choose what you're sharing. Yes, yeah, so Tim makes one click share your screen, and then it'll let you. You have to click one of the boxes that's in front of you. So what are we doing here? All right. I've just got the. Go and unmute yourself. We should do a Zoom on how to use Zoom, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, I think. Sorry, it's yeah, we haven't. If you share us your screen, we'll tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks. So, just explain it, John. No, I just did some photos there of um of the spring uh, the ridges and that sort of thing too. But um, I'm sorry, yeah, just for What's some reason it just won't. Um, That's good. Share screen. Oh, hang on, now we're in the right thing. So, um, where do I go, Alex? I'm on. Um, Desktop one. Yeah, we'll just click that, that'll do. Share. And then OK down the bottom. Okay. And yeah, so share down the bottom right once you've clicked what you want. He's got a bloody university degree too. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. There's only 81 people watching. Yeah, no, I'm sorry that it's uh, well, dropping I'm, rates. I'm really... John, yeah, that's um, getting. Good. <laughs> I think yeah, we'll just have to uh, give it a miss. I'm sorry. About yeah, that. That... <laughs> yeah, I wish COVID would disappear that quick. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll wrap it up there, eh? Yeah. Go on. You can show them for next time. Yeah, we'll I'll, I'll save them up. That's fine. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Cheers. Thank you.